All right. Well, here we go. Malachi chapter 3, 13, 14, and 15. Malachi 3, 13, 14, and 15. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, here we go again. Remember, it's been this way all through the whole thing. The prophet, the man of God, brings the word and the people are like, what? Here it goes again. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? Well, you have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept His ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up, even they even tempt God and go free. Ye. How about that? See, these verses here describe the people's arrogant attitude toward God. See, when we ask, what's the use of serving God? What really what we're asking is, what good does it do for me? Yeah. The focus is selfish. The focus is selfish. Our real question ought to be, what good does it do for God? That's the real question. See, we have to serve God just, uh, just because He's God and deserves to be served. Amen? Amen. It's the same in, in giving our, our tithe and our offering. We, we don't give our tithe and offering because it, God's going to go broke if we don't. Right? We give our tithe and our offering... Because it, it's a blessing to God and He blesses us back and it's His anyway. So as Malachi begins to wind down and close his book, he points out four different groups of people and what they said and what they did. And we're going to look at the first two of them tonight. The first group are the complainers. None of, none of us in here tonight are in this group. Uh, the complainers... Uh, well, you must have been in preparation for this. The complainers are people who were guilty of saying harsh things against the Lord. For one thing, they felt that serving the Lord was drudgery. It was futile to be His servants. I... I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. After all that God has done for me, to not serve Him would be crazy. The priests, as you recall all through this study so far, the priests may have been the leaders in this complaining, but the common people were just as guilty. Well... We're not getting anything out of it was their grievance. They, things just keep getting worse. Have, has that ever been anybody's experience? The more I press into God, the more I pray, the more I read the Word, the more I do all that I can do for the Lord, it just th- seems like hell just increases in my life. Am I the only one? <laughs> What in the world is that about? I believe you hit it on the head. The devil's mad. I think you're spot on. But it doesn't make it any more fun. 
And, and I've, I've talked to enough people besides myself that have gone through these very kinds of things. Things just keep getting worse. That, that if, <clears throat> if you've not decided, if you've not made a determination, if there isn't something within you that says, come hell or high water, I'm going forward, the tendency is that, you know what? It, life was easier before I got saved. Which is exactly what the enemy wants us to think. And life might have been easier before you got saved, but your destination has changed. I might be going through some stuff here, but it isn't nothing compared to what it would be like if I ended up in hell. I think that's the, the question you have to ask yourself. Am I willing to go through this thing? I was thinking, just what profit is it? And I've said that very thing. Counseling, marriage counseling in a big church, and I'm, I'm seeing uh, miracles happen in marriages. And I'm going away thrilled for them and I go to my house and it's a wreck my kids are either in jail or gone or something or finances and I'm going what what profit is this and I wanted to quit I definitely wanted to quit because it was a whole lot easier before I got into this marriage counseling gig and I, I talked to the person that was over the the whole thing. And he said, if you quit, Satan wins both ways. He wins all rest. He's not only dealing with stuff at home, but the people that you influence are without. Mm-hmm. And it, it kept me in, in place for a while because I, I had to make a decision. Am I going to press in on this thing or not? Regardless of um, what I'm getting out of it. Am I supposed to be doing this? One, yeah, that's probably going to do it. Is it, is it truthful to the people that we're dealing with? I'd have to say that. And then I'm looking at my family and going, well, that's not truthful, but can you press in? Can you keep pressing on regardless of your circumstances? Because God called you to do this thing. And I did. You know, I pressed in, and, and I can't say that our whole family, our, my boys and everything, squared away just because I made that decision. But it made me feel like I was on the right track. No matter what. No matter what my circumstances were. Whether I was making any money in my business, or my boys were squared away, or whatever, you know. I was, I'm, going, I'm saying to myself, I'm on the right track here. I'm okay, no matter what. And and then the, what she said about the enemy is the realization is when you are doing something and you're on the right track, you will have resistance from the enemy. We both we all know that. Right. Well, are we just going to put up with that? No. Now it's time to turn around and face the enemy and say, "Get off my property. This is not your property. This is not your space." Leave me in the, alone in the name of Jesus. Get your hands off my family. My time, you know, get right. the battle where I needed to do. And I go, when I went to uh, the counseling, I, did, I felt anointed there. And it was just like, oh, everybody's happy. <laughs> but when I turned around, I, I still had this battle going on. And so for me, I had to, I had to get past this. What profit is it? It doesn't matter. It's whether or not you're doing God's will. And are you going to stay on track doing it? That was for me. Can I, can I do one more thing? Yep. Um, when I finally realized that uh, it, it was the, the enemy, everything was getting worse and worse and worse. I was being... I, I just like, I'm like, no, I do 
just thought, you know what? Man, I actually would laugh and say, man, it doesn't matter because the worst is trying to make it for me means something awesome for me. So started getting to it and you knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's and good. Challenge him that it's like whatever, the worse you attack me, the better I want to you know, like yeah, so <laughs> So I want to go back just briefly, Bob, and touch on what you were saying about the, you know, the things that you were doing and it feels like that nothing's getting accomplished and is it worth going forward and is it worth carrying on? Is it worth keeping, staying in the battle? And when you were talking about that, I thought about Jeremiah. That poor guy. I mean, he spent his entire ministry telling people about God and about Jesus, you know, not about Jesus because he wasn't there yet, but I mean, but about about God and all that kind of, and not one convert the whole time. But he just kept persevering and plugging away and plugging away. I mean, if it was a goals, if it was about attaining goals, he didn't attain much. Or any prophet. Or any prophet. I mean, that's why they called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. I mean, he was broken the whole time, it seemed like. Listen, uh, we, a, a church, a church is like a bank or a home. You don't get anything out of it unless you put something into it. See, we serve God because it's the right thing to do, not because we're rewarded for our service. It's just the right thing to do. These complainers had a second complaint. And it was that the pagan people around them who didn't know the Lord were in better shape than the people of Judah. Hello? The wicked were prospering while the godly were suffering. And oftentimes it seems that way. Of course, it would have been difficult for the Jews to prove that they were godly because the reality is they were guilty of disobeying the Lord all the way through this thing. God would have blessed them if they would have yielded themselves to Him, but they preferred to have their own way and then complain about what didn't happen. None of, none of us fit this at all. The second thing was that the pagan people around them who didn't know the Lord were in better shape than the people of Judah. Psalm 102, 100, verse 2. See, it's, it's a serious thing to serve the Lord... It's a serious thing to serve the Lord. And we are commanded in Psalm 100 verse 2 that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. It's a sad thing when a servant of God is a worker merely doing his job because it's what he or she has to do or what, for what they can get out of it. <laughs> it's a sad thing when a servant of God is a worker merely doing a job because that's what he or she has to do or for what they get out of it. Isn't that amazing? What does the New Testament call that? Yeah. 
a hireling. And when the, when the wolves come in, because he's just a hireling, he doesn't own the sheep, what does he do? He gone. Philippians chapter 2 in the first 12 verses is God's portrait of Christ, God's ideal servant or shepherd. He, his example is the, the one that we should follow. Let me just... Let me just read these 12 verses for you because I, I think it paints a pretty vivid picture here. Verse 1, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love. Being of one accord, of of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. See, it's already shot holes in what the people that Malachi was talking to, right? Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. There's probably not much profit in that deal. Um, oh boy, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm going through a trial or a temptation, I, and, and it seems like after I've messed it up, and, and, and blown the whole thing, this kind of a verse comes to my mind. Which is, how much did you even resist? I mean, you're not bleeding. Nobody cut you. Nobody shot you. You, you know, <laughs> how much did you even resist? Or did you just, and oftentimes, you know, the other verse that comes to my mind, like a bull being led to the slaughter. You just go around, you know. Wander down the road. Dear, dear. Am I the only one? God help me. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those of earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a pretty powerful passage. When you stop and think about it and dissect it, many people, even Christian people, live only to make a good impression on others or to please themselves. Can I just tell you that selfishness brings discord. Selfishness brings discord. Paul stressed spiritual unity. <clears throat> Paul stressed <clears throat> spiritual unity. He asked the Philippians to love one another and to be one in spirit and one in purpose. Is that not the message for the church today? That we should be, that we should be one in spirit to love one another and, and one in, in purpose. 
Shouldn't we all be striving for the same goal? When we work together caring for the problems of others as if they were our problems, we demonstrate Christ's example of putting others first and we experience unity. It's just the way it is. It's just the way God works. Don't be so concerned about making a good impression or meeting your own needs that you strain relationships in the family of God. Now, that's just good advice. That's just, that's just down-home good advice. Don't be so concerned about making a good impression or meeting your own needs that you strain relationships in God's family. Often people excuse selfishness, pride, or evil by claiming their rights. Uh, how many rights do we even have, Irene? We have the right to be a child of God because of what Christ paid for on the cross. And that's just about as far as it goes. As far as our rights. Oftentimes, and this is, I, I don't mean to be ugly, but in the world that we live in today, I think these fit. Oftentimes, people say, I can cheat on this test. After all, I deserve to pass this class. You know what? You're selling a game. A new game. A new monopoly game that's okay to cheat at. That's the premise of the game. This is the cheating monopoly game. And it's like that. I bet Bill Gates has got the patent on it, too. <laughs> it's our society. I, ch I, I can cheat on this test. After all, I deserve to pass. I can spend all this money on myself. I worked hard for it. This, I, I, this is a sensitive subject, but I can get an abortion because I have a, the right to control my own body. But the reality is, church, as believers, we should have a different attitude. One that enables us to lay, our, lay aside our rights in order to serve others. If we say we follow Christ, we must also say that we want to live as He lived. Every time I read something like this or put something like this down on paper, my mind automatically goes back to the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, you follow me as I follow Christ. For him to be able to say, you follow me as I follow Christ, was in effect, he was heaping a huge amount of responsibility on himself because he knew the folks that were following him. And he knew, if you're going to say, you follow me as I follow Christ, I better be following Christ. That's, that's huge. His mind was set like flint. Which is why he went to Jerusalem and got beat up again. And they said, don't go, don't go. He had to go. And Paul got, none of us in this room have probably got beat up for the gospel. I'll do the preaching. I know. <laughs> That's tough. It's so. It seems to me like it's just so easy for the enemy to come in and just manipulate us, uh, just a touch, and just get it. 
You know what a bullseye is? Everybody know what a bullseye is? They usually have two of them. You got one on the back of your head, Sean. <laughs> At RJ. You might need to go back there and pinch him again. A bullseye is the place to hit on a target. If you're hitting the bullseye, you're spot on. So the bullseye becomes the mark. Right? It's the mark. The definition of sin is missing the mark. Whether it's right on the very edge or whether it's ten miles off. You've missed the mark. And so it's sin. If we say we follow Christ, we must also say that we want to be live as He lived. We ought to develop an attitude, church, of humility as we serve, even when we're not likely to get recognition for our efforts. And we're in a recognition-driven society. Bless God, I want to be recognized for everything I do, everything I've ever done, everything I ever will do. Are you selfishly clinging to your rights or are you willing to serve? Look at Malachi chapter 3, 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. How many of you know that's true? So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I will make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. You know what that's talking about? There's coming, there's coming judgment. There's, there's, there's coming a day when, when there's going to be a reckoning. So that was, that was the complainers. That was the complainers. Now I want to spend the rest of our time tonight looking at the believers. Amen. Looking at the believers, though uh, there there was a group of true believers in this remnant, and they remained faithful to the Lord in the midst of the griping, the grumbling, the complaining, all of those kinds of things. There's always been God has always had a remnant of people, and He does in this case. They feared the Lord which means they held Him in awe and worshipped Him as the Lord Almighty. They met together not to complain, but to encourage and edify one another. Isn't it amazing that it says in the New Testament that we ought not forsake the fellowshipping together, but come together where we can build one another up with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and, and bear one another's burdens and all these kinds of things. He's talking about it right here. They met together, not to complain, but to encourage and edify one another. They spoke about the Lord, and they weren't afraid for Him to hear what they were saying. How many times have we said things that we're like, oh, I wish God hadn't heard that. <laughs> Their assembly probably wasn't a large one. And, and they may have thought that very little was happening because they met and worshipped, but God was paying attention and He was keeping a record of their words. Their neighbors may have even laughed at them, but God was pleased with them. They weren't wasting their time because they were investing in eternity. Church, I think if we're going to get anything out of this life, we're going to have to do it 
through an eternal pros- uh, an eternal outlook. Because if we're looking for the reward here on earth, we've already got the reward. God claimed them as His own. Isn't it great to know that you're called a child of the Most High God? Isn't that good? He's my Father. And He loves me. As messed up as I can be, He still loves me. God claimed them as His own. God promised to spare them in the future judgment. And everybody would see that there is a difference between the righteous and the wicked and that this difference is important. Not just important, it's vital. Because we're called, in, in the New Testament, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. One of the sins of the priests was that they failed to make the distinction between the way of holiness and the way of sin. That was their job. That was their job, was to make a distinction between the way of holiness and in the way of sin. To them, one sacrifice was just as good as another. Yet, they were supposed to teach the people the difference between the holy and the common and cause them to discern between clean and unclean. You can look it up in Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 23. You don't have that one, Steve. I marked it in mine. I didn't mark it in yours. I'm sorry. Um, Many of God's faithful servants become discouraged because the times are difficult, the crowds are small, and the work seems unappreciated. It can seem that way. Times are hard. Sometimes the crowds are small. Sometimes... The work does seem to be unappreciated. But if we're doing it with an eternal perspective, if we're doing it for the glory and honor of God, then what does it matter? Well, if there's only one or two coming to Bible study class, then we're just not going to have Bible study class. Oh, you mean that one and two, one or two people are not worth you investing your time in one or two people? Well, what if, the, what if those one or two people that you invest your time in take what you've taught them and go outside and turn the place upside down? Now what? how valuable is it? People who weren't, or who rather who aren't really walking with the Lord seem to be getting more attention uh, than, than are the faithful servants. And it can seem that way. But the day will come when, when, when God will reveal His jewels and, and then the faithful re, will receive their reward. Now, I don't say much about politics. But I don't know if you follow the news much, but we've got a candidate running for president that is completely gay. I mean, and he, he kisses his guy on the TV and all that kind of stuff. He said this week, He said that people, Christians, that vote for Trump should be ashamed of themselves because because nowhere in Scripture does, does he see anyone, any way that what Trump does lines up uh, or, or in God's Word. And I thought, you know, i got a few passages that I could point out to you. Yeah. Yeah. I saw on my Facebook page that Bible I'm sure he does. Yeah, I'm sure he does. But God's, got, God's Word is, stays the same. I know it's a controversial subject. 
God, God, God loves him, and we have to understand that. But God does not love his behavior. But they use it, and my, this is my point, they're, they're trying to use the Bible to manipulate their, their stand and their candidacy. It, it, it just amazes me. The day will come when God will reveal. That's a given. When, when He separates the sheep from the goats. Every discouraged servant of God needs to read and ponder 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-5. through 5. And I'm going to close with this. Those very verses. It says this, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I know nothing against myself. Yet, I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will, bring, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. When I, I, get, in, I get asked to do funerals and, and memorial services all the time, and I don't like doing them, especially if I don't know them. And I try not to, you know, especially if I don't know a person, what the family wants me to say is, your loved one is in a far better place. But I can't say that if I don't know them. You understand? That's between them and God, whether they made that or not. Even when someone has taken their life, We just want to blanketly say that they're, they, they, they don't make it. That would make you a false witness, wouldn't it? What we have to do is we have to say, you know what? God is way bigger than all of this. And I'm not going to stand here and say, well, you know, I believe that your, your, your loved one either didn't or did or, or whatever. That is not for me to say. My job is just to bring the Scripture and present that and say, you know, God's a big enough God that He can take care of all this stuff. And I'm not going to add my two cents worth that's only worth about a buck and a half. That didn't make a bit of sense. I meant a penny. I meant a penny. See, a servant does what his master tells him to do. Period. We must do what God tells us to do in the Bible and through His Holy Spirit. Every day, God presents us with needs and opportunities that challenges us to do what we know is right. And I ashamedly stand before you tonight and tell you that there have been many times when I have not done what was right. <coughs> so let me go back to the bullseye. For me, to miss the mark is just as much missing the mark as it is for homosexuality, as it is for murder, as it is for 
thievery as it is for all these other things. We have to remember that sin is missing the mark. And every one of us, from time to time, miss the mark. And we have to come back before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Help me. I've had to do that today. Every day God presents us with needs and opportunities that challenge us to do what we know is right. And we sometimes don't do what is right. And I don't know if it's to my own detriment or what, but I, I reveal that I don't always do what's right. I have to ask God for forgiveness just the same way as every one of the rest of you do. Every day, God presents us with needs and opportunities that challenge us to do what we know is right. <clears throat> So I, here's a little story about that. Thing. My nephew, he's a really nice looking guy and does Hollywood stuff down there. Just a little bit parts and whatnot. And he, he watches, this, there's a magazine or paper that comes out that you can go and try out some different things. And one was for a Christmas show. And they said, show up at wherever it was, Universal Studios or something, in white shoes, white pants, white coat, or white shirt. Show up there, and uh, we'll go through the interview process or whatever they do. He gets there, and he's a, he's a Christian guy, and he, his buddy, they were late, and they're just saying, Lord, this, they showed up in the studio, and they're practically the last guys in the gate. The parking lot is full, and they said, Lord, this use this. This is futile. There's 400 people there at least. Right at the very beginning there's a there's a black lady and that, that was a, important. Uh, the black lady with her the hood up and she's trying to start her car. And they said, you know, we're late. Let's jump her car. So they get out. Remember, white shoes, white pants, white shirt. So they get a little scuffed up just doing that. And they're later now. But they help her. And they go in and here's this whole crowd of white white. And they're and all these guys that try out are about the same height and they look the same, they're just you know, Hollywood guys. Uh, anyway, and, and um, they the announcement said, Well, you know, we've got so many people here, we're gonna eat early. And uh, it was about 10 o'clock or something. He says, uh, uh, we'll have everybody uh, go get a tray, and, and I don't know how they did it. And we're having spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> Everybody's in white. in white. So they go do that, and everybody's just ticking to on and off. A lot of guys are not even eating. And they're talking, and he can hear this. this oh, they're, they're talking about... You know, this is futile. What good is this for me? And, you know, the complainers. And right in the, the walkway there, a, uh, a guy came along and spilled his tray. It was one of the staff spilled his tray there. And it just, whoosh, here's the study for getting meatballs. And it gets on people's clothing. It gets on their clothing a little bit. And they're, just, they're looking at each other and going, Let's clean, help him clean it up. So here comes the janitor, and there's only two guys out of 400 that are out there cleaning up, and they're they're getting the spaghetti on there. You know, it's over with. We're done. But we just they pray, Lord, just use us. And so they're kind of into that. They're thinking, well, this is just part of what God's doing today for us. Now, we get to help somebody, and it was embarrassing to spill, and the, the janitor was having trouble picking up. Spaghetti. We got it all done, and and then there was a quiet, and and somebody comes up to this, the podium and says, "Well, um, we're done for today. Uh, we've chosen who we want." And everybody grumbles. Hey, we haven't even talked to anybody. We haven't interviewed. We haven't done anything. And they said, "No, uh, we've already chosen the guys." And then just then, the lady that was out front with the, the battery 
walks up on the stage. Mm -hmm. And then the guy with the children, he walks up on the stage. And these are the CEOs of this network. For It's a Christian network. And the whole the Christmas theme was forgiveness and stewardship and whatever the thing is. They want to get two guys out of 400 that, that had those qualities. And he said, well, we've, we've picked the two guys. And it's those guys back there that... The help of the spaghetti and, and the lady said, yeah, and you helped me out front there with the, the battery thing. And he said, we got to walk up there covered with spaghetti and got dirt all over us and everything. And, of course, everybody else left in the house. And he said, you know, you never know that last line what he said, what God is going to do and put in your place. And are you going to respond to it? There's probably other Christians in there. They drove right by that lady. Did not want to help because I'm on focus. I got to get my my deal done. And he wound up having a bit part in this TV Christmas special. He and his buddy, you know, they had a walk through or something, you know. Got in there, made some money, and the Lord blessed them. Pretty neat. It's amazing. Yeah, it 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 exactly correlates with the story that I've preached of. A few times. I don't know if I've ever preached it here, but uh, this, it's the same story. It's, it's, but this guy and his buddy went to Vietnam together, and and uh, the the one guy wanted to be an artist or something like that, and he he, he drew this picture or whatever. And anyway, the the long and the short of it is, um, this guy's kid gets killed in 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 the service, and and he had drawn a picture. A portrait of of his boy, and this guy was a very wealthy art collector, and uh, and at the at the end of his life, he was going to sell all of his art and stuff, and uh, art collectors from all over the world came to that to that sale, mm -hmm. and uh, the auctioneer got up there, and the first you know deal on the on the auction block was the portrait that this guy had drawn uh, of this other guy's son and uh, said who's who'll start the bidding and nobody would nobody would bid on it they put that away get the good stuff you know they wanted the good stuff and the the guy that drew it was there and he was in the back and he said I'll give you ten dollars or whatever for it and so, anybody want to up that? No, nope, nobody did. So, bam, he hits the thing. And he said, would like to just let you know that this concludes today's auction. Uh, it's done. We appreciate you all coming. But that concludes the auction because on the back of the portrait of the sun was an inscription that said, whoever gets the sun gets it all. Uh, and uh, so, it, it, you know, I, I chopped it up, and it's it's way better if I just read the whole story. But it's it's pretty powerful, and, and it's so true. Whoever gets the sun gets it all. And spiritually speaking, if we have the sun, we have it all. We have everything we need. 